Welcome to the Ambassadorial Series. I'm Jill Doherty. Probably no Americans have as unique and in-depth perspective on Russia as American ambassadors. They arrive in their posts in Moscow, often with deep knowledge of the country and of the language. They live in Russia. They meet and negotiate with the highest Russian officials. They travel around the country and interact with Russian citizens. They not only are eyewitnesses to history, they're actors in history. In the ambassadorial series, we hear from all the living U.S. ambassadors to modern Russia and to the Soviet Union before it. They recount their personal experiences in Moscow, the people that they met, the challenges, and even the dangers they faced. And with the benefit of time to ponder these experiences, they tell us how they understand Russia, how they understand the relationship between Russia and the United States, and the impact of that relationship on the world. Ambassador John Sullivan, thank you very much for talking with us. Uh, you are actually just back from Moscow, practically, and very interested in your perspective. You know, I was going back and looking at some of the events that happened in almost three years that you were in Moscow. I can't think of, of a more challenging time. I mean, you have the war in Ukraine, economic confrontation with enormous sanctions, diplomatic confrontation, reduction of staff in Moscow at the embassy, Americans that were arrested and uh, convicted, and then you have COVID. So all of these things must have affected you, and not to mention the fact that you served under two very different presidents, uh, obviously Donald Trump and Joe Biden. So maybe we could begin with those presidents. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd be very interested in how did the difference in those administrations affect your work in Moscow? Thanks, Jill. It's terrific to be here with you. I'm, I'm delighted to talk about my experiences in, in Moscow. It was an amazing experience, a fantastic job. Uh, I loved every minute of it, as challenging as it was. Um, substantively, very little difference when administration the administration changed. Um, as a matter of, uh, what's the right word, uh, policy formulation or the bureaucracy, the, the, more, the most significant change from my perspective was um, I had a lot more engagement with the White House and the President. Um, I never spoke to President Trump while I was ambassador. Uh, from uh, the day I got confirmed until today, I've not spoken to him. Um, I, sp I had a lot of engagement with him because before I went to Moscow, I was the Deputy Secretary of State for almost three years and had a lot of engagement with him. He knew me, I knew him, um, but I never spoke to him about Russia. I think it was an indication that he had, uh, he had other priorities. He was focused on his relationship with Putin. He had some uh, ideas that he could He'd, exp he'd explained them to me that he thought he could, through a personal relationship with Putin, somehow change his or Russia's attitude toward us. He once said to me, this is Trump speaking, I know they're not our friends. Uh, but he was misguided in thinking that his personal relationship with Putin could, uh, could change the U.S.-Russia dynamic. Um, but he really wasn't engaged in policy. Uh, my contact here in Washington, I was grounded, so to speak, here through uh, Secretary Pompeo. I was very close to him. I had served as his deputy secretary for over a year and a half, uh, and he and I saw eye to eye on Russia policy, and that he was really my, uh, my touchstone back here in Washington. Uh, when I needed guidance, when I wanted to talk to somebody about what I'd seen, um, the new administration, however, went back to what I would call, I'd served previously in the two prior Bush administrations, the more usual interagency process. I had more engagement with the NSC and with President Biden himself. Um, the substance of what I was doing as ambassador and the policies that I was implementing didn't change that much. Uh, but where I got my instructions and whom I engaged with here in Washington, that was the principal change that I noticed. 
You know, what you're talking about, I think, is very interesting, um, you know, changes from one, one administration to the other. And Russians, at least in my experience, often think that ultimately it's the same. It's the same United States. Presidents come and go, but the policy remains. I mean, did, do you think, how would you characterize how the Russian officials that you interacted with saw that switch between presidents? Did they think it actually, there was a difference, or did they think it was the same old policy? It depends. Uh, they thought there was a difference with Trump. I think they were mistaken about that. But to your point, Jill, they also think that there is, as others have said, that there's a deep state mm -hmm. uh, that is Russophobic. They really believe that. Uh, they can't uh, conceive of the notion that their actions cause Americans to have uh, negative views of Russia, and particularly the Russian security services. So uh, using a Novichok nerve agent to try to assassinate a former Russian FSB officer in Salisbury, and thereby closing down large parts of a UK city, killing an innocent woman, uh, making a lot of other people sick, uh, when it was proven with almost geometric precision that the GRU had done it, then sort of uh, thumbing their noses at us, putting the two GRU officers on camera, these, for lack of a better term, thugs in leather jackets, who try to explain that, well, of course, all we had wanted to do all our lives was to go to Salisbury to see the cathedral and the cathedral spire. And I interpreted that as Putin just saying to us. And so uh, there's, it's a two-way street. Uh, there's a, there is a lot across the interagency. It's bipartisan. There is a very firm desire to confront the Russians. And this is pre-February 24th. Um, it was bipartisan. Uh, Trump himself thought that he could, uh, this is my own theory, uh, that he could somehow change or moderate Russian behavior through his relationship with Putin. I don't think there was ever some sort of corrupt bargain that he was some, you know, Manchurian candidate president of the Russians. Because, Jill, I saw him try to do the same things with G, Modi, Abi. He thought his personal relationship with these leaders was going to have an effect on their overall policies toward the United States, and it just, he, he just really couldn't, couldn't understand that there were bigger issues at play in many of these relationships. Well, let's turn it around then. Let's look at the Russians, and you began to, to get into this. <clears throat> what do you think they expected from Trump? Well, that's a good question. I had never thought of it. Boy, you're good. <laughs> uh, I hadn't thought of it that way. What did they expect from Trump? Um, I guess they probably thought uh, that they would get a more favorable reset than they got from Obama, uh, and that Trump would be, uh, as he appeared and occasionally acted, to be less concerned about human rights issues, uh, that maybe the president wouldn't talk about something like the attempted assass assassination of Alexei Navalny the way President Biden has. Um, this is a footnote, a one substantive change. My recollection is the U.S. under President Trump didn't impose sanctions on Russia uh, in conjunction with the EU after uh, my, well, let me get the sequence right. I, um, there were two rounds of sanctions, one when he was poisoned and then a second round when he was arrested. He was poisoned in August of 20, arrested right before Biden's inauguration in January of 21. The EU imposed two rounds of sanctions. The U.S. caught up and imposed sanctions because of what the Russians had done to Navalny under Biden in March of 21. That's one small example of where the Russians might think he's going to cut us more slack. Mm -hmm. You know, you're mentioning sanctions, and obviously uh, this has been a recurring issue. Right now it's very important, but it always has been. Mm -hmm. in, at least with President Putin. And this is your area of expertise. I mean, trade, <coughs> sanctions, mm -hmm. yeah. investment, et cetera. Uh, the old question is, do they work? 
But let's back up. When you look at the sanctions, and I know over years there have been different purposes for different sanctions, but essentially the, the latest round during the war in Ukraine, mm -hmm. what was the purpose of sanctions at that point? What is the purpose now? And do they work? So we talk about sanctions, but there are actually a number of components to it. There are sanctions, financial sanction, and there are export controls, mm -hmm. and there are other actions that we've taken, closing airspace, all that. Um, the sanctions, if we, if, we call, if we use that word to refer to all of that, there are several broad purposes. Certainly want, we want to change Russian policy, moderate it, but something else that was very much on our minds, which is going to have to have a, take longer to uh, to have an effect, is to try to degrade the Russian industrial base, particularly its military industrial base, and that's in particular where export controls come in. The key to export controls is enforcement. Uh, if they're enforced, they will uh, really hurt the Russians. Uh, the Russians, however, are, as are the Iranians and, and other regimes, uh, have developed ways to try to work around them. The key now for the Biden administration, for the West, for those who want to really uh, have an effective response to Russia's aggressive, horrific war, is to enforce those export controls because that's what will deny uh, the Russian military, the technology, the computer chips and so forth to build the smart weapons that they are using to try to blast Kiev uh, into the dark ages and force, and they won't succeed, but try to force their surrender. Do you think that anything, going back to February 24th, right around that, right before that period, that anything that the United States could have done with sanctions or any other instrument like that could have changed Putin's? No, no. He, he had, my assessment, again, it's my own personal opinion, uh, based on my interactions with Russian government officials from the most senior all the way down and my uh, engagement with U.S. government official, officials, with our military, with our uh, intelligence community, he had decided uh, this a long time ago. Mm -hmm. This has been his imperial ambition for a long time, years and years, before 2000, not just before February 24th, 2020, before 2014, as mm -hmm. his famous or infamous Munich Security uh, Conference speech uh, revealed. This has been his, his ambition to regather the Russian, the Russian lands, his, his great achievement, he thinks, as president. Uh, how he would implement it, has, how he would accomplish that, uh, has been something he's worked on for a long time. What I believe, Jill, is that they thought with 10 plus years of investment in their military, that they had the wherewithal to accomplish what they set out to do on February 24th, which is a very quick blitzkrieg-like envelopment of Ukraine, decapitating the government, removing Zelensky, um, and what, unfortunately, well, fortunately for the rest of the world, unfortunately for, for President Putin is uh, what's been revealed is that his military and his security services, we can't forget about that, mm -hmm. uh, were not up to uh, the task that they were given. Now, will he retreat from that task? Absolutely not. This is his, this is his ambition, and it's not in him to step back and surrender. He never would, and he could not possibly, it's unfathomable for him to do so to someone whom he uh, has so little respect for in the current president of Ukraine, Zelensky, who somebody like uh, Dmitry Medvedev, the former president, calls, you know, a, you know, a drug-addicted Nazi. Um, so, Again, to get back to sanctions and export controls, yeah, making life hard for, for uh, the average Russian, we didn't set out to do that. We don't want to punish the Russian people. That was certainly the talking point from this administration. We're not imposing sanctions on the Russian people. We're imposing them on the Russian government to deter their actions. But of course it's going to hurt the Russian people, the financial sanctions that have been imposed, the contraction of the Russian economy.
But where I think sanctions and export controls will have the greatest effect, my hope is that it will make the military industrial complex that Putin would rely on to try to rebuild his military now to accomplish the ultimate goals of his special military operation. It's gonna be difficult for him to do if sanctions and export controls are enforced effectively. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go back to February 24th, when the war began, it's really a fascinating time on, on one level, which is the United States was definite in saying there is going to be an invasion. And Russia, I can remember the statements from the foreign ministry, that's ridiculous, right. this is not going to happen. And they were very adamant about that. There you are, kind of in the middle of this, uh, trying to figure out, okay, you know what the US government knows, and you see what the Russians are saying. Did you get any indication, just offbeat impressions, you know, secondhand comment, anything that led you to think that the Russians actually, at that point, yes, were going to invade, but coming from Russia? Uh, you mean but from statements that they made? Yeah, officially. You mean reading tea leaves, so exactly. to speak. Not reading intelligence reports and satellite photos, that right. sort of thing. Um, yeah, there was. There, there was because, in, in the following sense, uh, when I would engage with uh, senior Russian officials and tell them, we know what you're gonna do and the consequences for you, the consequences for Ukraine surely will be awful, but for Russia, from the united response, the global response to uh, your initiation of an aggressive war uh, are gonna be catastrophic for Russia. It was, a, the, the Russian response was, you don't understand. We're back. We're not the economic colossus we were when we were the Soviet Union, but our military is certainly back. And whatever's gonna happen with Ukraine, it's our business, we'll take care of it. Wow. A lot of confidence, hubris. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so a couple of things though, Jill, that your, your question and, and comments, it, it quite, astute comments about uh, the, the statements the Russians were making though is first, they were lying through their teeth, we know that now, because there's no way that the special military operation, it's now failed, spectacularly so, but for that military operation to kick off at uh, zero dark 30 on February 24th, that was months and months in the making, plans and preparations. So Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, said just days before he would in the, the invasion, and he'd said it multiple times before, we're not going to, and we have no plans to. Mm -hmm. No one ever now asks him, well, of course you had plans to, because look what you did. That required planning, preparation, et cetera. They lied to their teeth. The person I think who should be most uh, offended by that is President Macron of, of France. He was lied to by Putin multiple times to his face. But today people just say, eh, you know, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm very, uh, what's the right word? Um, I, I'm not optimistic about the future of this, how this conflict will unfold. Um, not because I, uh, I'm certainly never gonna want to underestimate the Ukrainians uh, again. Uh, but just because I think the Russians, the Russian government is not going, led by President Putin, is not going to change its strategic goals in, in Ukraine. And um, it just offends me that, uh, that a government, a president, a foreign minister could lie to the world, to other world leaders launch this aggressive war. Yeah, it was terrific that 141 countries in the UN General Assembly voted to condemn and deplore what the Russians do, but the why, why any Russian government official today is accepted in polite company in any other world capital is beyond me. What do people think is gonna happen? If this succeeds, it's, uh, it's a bad thing for the world, not just for Europe and not just for, 
for NATO and certainly not for, for Ukraine. Did you ever call Lavrov's bluff? Did you ever talk to him I and say, or any other official, and just say, look, I know, we know what you're doing? You, you know, it's, I, I've, not just on, uh, on the Ukraine war, but on election interference. Another case where I said, we know what you're doing. In that case, it was, we know what you've done and we know what you're doing. With Ukraine, it was, we know what you're gonna do. The Russians are masters at just, you're wrong. Facts don't matter. Uh, rhetoric doesn't matter. They are capable of presenting any case they want to make, and they were, they were instructed to make a case that there was going to be no invasion of Ukraine. There were no plans to invade Ukraine. They never engaged in election interference in the United States. It was unthinkable. And oh, by the way, and that's when they turned to their famous what about isms. Oh, what about this? What about that? What about uh, you know Kosovo? What about Iraq? What about Afghan? So. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, CIA Director Bill Burns went over there to Moscow uh, in November 2021 mm -hmm. and essentially said what you're, you're saying. I was with him. Which, uh, perfect. Okay. okay. So tell us what it was like. because And w w what he said to the Russians, maybe behind the scenes, but also how far back did the planning go? I mean, can you pin it down? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. It, it, absolutely. Um, because there had been in the past, in the spring of 21, you'll recall, there was a buildup in Russia, in southwestern Russia, near, uh, near the bo their border with, uh, with Ukraine of the Russian military. The people were, our government was concerned about, in fact, the government of the United Kingdom was, I was, think, even more concerned than we were. They thought, there was serious thought that the Russians were going to invade Ukraine in the spring of 20. 21, it probably, given the military concentrations at the time, the speculation was there would be a more limited incursion. Uh, but we thought they might do it then. And this was in the run up to Biden's meeting with Putin in, in Geneva in June of 21. By that point, we saw that there, you know, they had left some of the logistical concentrations, field hospitals, ammuni ammunition depots in, uh, in southwestern Russia and principally in Crimea. And I remember having a conversation with some senior U.S. military officials who said uh, they're, uh, you know, what they might do is this is a feint and they'll leave in place infrastructure that they're building now and at some point they may faint again but at some point they'll really do it, and they did. They're building up, they've they built up in the spring of 21 field hospitals, as I recall, ammunition depots that weren't there before 2021. But they left them, they took their troops out, but they left these, uh, you know, this infrastructure that they could use if they were going to uh, invade Ukraine. And um, what I think the intelligence community, uh, what the intelligence community saw in the fall was a much larger massing of troops. Now it was, um, my recollection was at the start of the, when the invasion kicked off, it was somewhere in the neighborhood, 180, 200,000 troops. And what was different though, and this happened in late 21, January 22, is they moved a lot of troops into Belarus. Mm -hmm. That was different, they'd not done that before. They moved more troops into Belarus than we'd seen before. And that was the giveaway that they were gonna try an assault south from Belarus to Kyiv, which is not that far across the border. Unfortunately, it's not funny, unfortunately for the Russian soldiers involved. It wasn't that far, but it was also through um, the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw during the retreat from Kyiv that the Russian military ordered its soldiers to entrench mm -hmm. in, the, in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, exposing their people to, uh, to radiation poisoning. Uh, just another example of absolutely horrific events that have happened, catastrophes, for the Russian military and the security services, whether it's the sinking of their flagship, mm 
We just saw a few days ago a, a, a strike by the Ukrainians on a, on a building uh, in eastern Ukraine that's apparently killed a lot of Russian soldiers and, pic and particularly new recruits who have just arrived in the country. And again, this is from press reports. Among other mistakes that were made is they were housing these troops in and around an ammunition depot such that when the missiles hit, they not only destroyed the building that housed them, but the ammunition depot blew up. So we now have conservative Russian nationalists complaining about their military, about what the heck are we doing? Our flagships on the bottom of the Black Sea. We've had troops get sick from radiation poisoning for entrenching in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. It's like Keystone Cops. Yeah. Let's get back to the William Burns meeting. Yes with his, uh, his <coughs> counterpart, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Patrushev. And it, it's interesting what you seem to be saying, because a lot of other officials were saying, no, you know, that's ridiculous, we aren't going to do that. But it sounds like Patrushev was saying, yeah, so what? Well, his attitude, sort of, his attitude was, we're not going to do it, but if we wanted to, we could. <laughs> and what are you going to do about it? Mm. We're not, we realize we're not, the economic colossus the Soviet Union was, 350 million people. Uh, but boy, we're back. We've got, uh, we've got a strong military. Uh, and we're not gonna invade Ukraine. But the subtext was, if we wanted to, it's not a problem. And this is our neighborhood, so butt out. We'll take care of it. Yeah. He had a similar attitude with respect to Belarus in August of 2020, the August 9th election. Uh, when the Belarusians, when Lukashenko cracked down on election protesters, uh, we spoke to the Russians again uh, at a very high level. I met with uh, Sergei Lavrov, um, and our message was don't invade Ukraine. We didn't, there were some troop movements, the Russians were just being prepared, but it turned out, you know, the Russians were saying that we're not going to do it. But when they sent it to me back then, they were saying it in the sense of, we don't need to. We've got these guys under our thumb. What, what they needed to do was send in some FSB contingents, replace some media people in Minsk. They didn't need to send in the Russian army. Mm. With Ukraine, uh, it was a different story. Mm -hmm. You know, if we could turn now to your diplomatic work. Mm -hmm. I mean, you come at a time um, there, there was an early moment in April 2021 where uh, solar winds hack takes place, yeah. alleged Russian attempts to meddle in the election, yep. and U.S. has sanctions, expels Russian diplomats, and then the Kremlin calls you, summons you, and says, we recommend that you leave. Yep. They didn't make you persona non grata, no. but they did suggest very strongly I, that you leave Moscow. I can give you the full background. That G was a me memorable a bit, yes. couple of weeks. Well, what had happened was when Biden was elected, he had four issues that he wanted the IC to or the U.S. government, particularly the IC, to advise them on election interference, solar winds, and cyber hacks, um, Afghan bounties. Remember that mm -hmm. that story that the that the the GRU was paying the Taliban right. to kill Americans in Afghanistan, um, and we had the Navalny case. So uh, there were four. There, my recollection is those were f the four big principal front and center irritants. The most significant at the time being um, solar winds and cyber. We were really concerned about cyber attacks, et cetera. Um, so it's, uh, we had, we had a, a bit of a very modest positive step, or at least a step. I know there are a lot of people, both Republicans and Democrats, who might, some Republicans and Democrats who might disagree with the extension of New Start. The New Start Treaty was extended for five years, which President Biden decided it early, his first or second day in office, we're going to extend the New Start Treaty, uh, which both sides then agreed to. It got more complicated, and I can go into that. It's an example of nothing is easy with the Russians, but we did get that treaty uh, extended for five years. But we had these other four matters lingering. 
President Biden was interviewed by George Stephanopoulos in March, and uh, he asked President Biden whether Putin was a killer, and the president didn't, didn't say Putin is a killer, but said, uh-huh, or yes. Putin and the Kremlin, they took umbrage, they withdrew the Russian ambassador to the United States, uh, Ambassador Antonov, was recalled to Moscow. The Biden administration didn't do anything. I stayed. Um, and we, um, we imposed sanctions based on Navalny's poisoning and arrest in March in conjunction with the EU. But then, what you're pointing to, Jill, is in April, for solar winds and election interference, we imposed a few modest sanctions. We expelled 10 Russian diplomats. Mm -hmm. We sort of pushed to one side the Afghan bounty story, which always troubled me. I thought neither administration handled that story well, not story, that matter well. Um, and I, there, the Russian ambassador had been home for a month at that point, and I was just sitting pretty in Moscow. Uh, I didn't do it intentionally, uh, but I guess after the fact, it must have been perceived as a bit of uh, grandstanding by me in that I invited Ambassador Antonov to lunch with me at Spasso House. <laughs> uh, and uh, the ambassador told me uh, an interesting story. He said uh, when he got word that Moscow wanted him to come home, he didn't know why. They didn't tell him. Hmm. Um, there had been press reports that he had gotten, I forget whether it was which of our vaccines he had gotten, Pfizer or Moderna, uh, which was noticed in Moscow. And I think he wasn't sure why he was being recalled. And it turned out he was being recalled because Biden had said Putin was a killer. So all this, all this develops. We impose more sanctions on solar winds, Navalny, election interference. We throw out 10 more Russian diplomats. They throw out 10 of my colleagues. And I get a call. Actually, the way it, the way it played out, Jill, now as I recall, the president sent me in to the Kremlin to meet with Yuri Yushikov, uh, President Putin's foreign policy advisor, former ambassador to the United States, to preview what was coming the next day. We're gonna impose sanctions, the president said this, on solar winds, election interference, laid all this out. Um, it's coming, he wanted me, the president wanted me to tell you this in advance, he rethanked me. And then the next day, he, he called me in. And uh, the sanctions had been announced and uh, he said to me, mm, yeah, it was that. That's not good. Um, you should you should probably go home. And I said, "Excuse me." He said, uh, "You know, you should go." Like, what are you saying? And he said, uh, "Well, you know, Anatoly, their ambassador, to the, he's been." Yeah. I said, "So are you declaring me persona non grata because President Biden decides?" when I come and go, he said, oh, no, 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 no. We're not declaring you persona non grata, but if you stay, no one in the Russian government will speak to you. Hmm. You'll just be wasting your time. And my recollection is there were a couple of presidential phone calls at that point uh, because, and it's how, it's from those phone calls the Geneva summit is then arranged because we sort of reach a little boiling point there, uh, and you know Biden's called him a killer. We've imposed sanctions, blah, and the presidents have a couple of phone calls. And in one of those calls, I believe Putin said something like, "And you should take your ambassador home because he's not going to have anything to do here if you leave him here." So at that point, and we haven't talked about this yet because of the pandemic. I hadn't been home or seen my family in 13 months, mm. and I was ready to go home. So uh, that's what I did. I talked to the White House. White House president said fine. Um, and I came home, it was toward the end of April, 
and uh, I it, and this hap, had the uh, the uh, advantage of being the truth. I was coming home soon anyway because at that point I could travel. I hadn't been home in 13 months, and it was time for me to see my family. And and I said this publicly at the time. And in fact, I think the White House may have issued a press statement to this effect. Um, I hadn't met yet in person the president. Uh, I knew Secretary Blinken from before he became secretary, but I hadn't had an in-person meeting with the secretary as secretary. I hadn't met in person with Jake Sullivan. I'd had lots of video conferences with him. I said, it was time for me to see my family, to see the new administration. I haven't been home in 13 months. So, and the Russians weren't going to talk to me anyway. So I came home. And I was here, uh, I stayed here until Biden went to Geneva uh, in mid, mid-June. Uh, and I went to Geneva with, uh, with the president. I was in the room the, when there was an extended bilateral meeting between Biden and Putin. Uh, Biden and Putin met um, with the secretary and the foreign minister first, and then they had an expanded meeting at which um, Jake Sullivan and I, and I believe Toria Nuland came in and met, were on the U.S. side. And on the Russian side, in addition to Lavrov, it was Yuri Yushikov, uh, Peskov, the press spokesperson for the Kremlin. And interestingly, uh, now looking back at it, and even at the time we thought it was curious, um, the Russian side brought General Gar- uh, Colonel General Gerasimov. Gerasimov sat at the table, and there was no thought on our side of bringing Chairman Milley. And, Anyway, um, but I went with uh, went with the president and a uh, one of the most the, the uh, an amusing thing that the president said to me, and he was the second president to make this suggestion uh, to me. President Trump had as well. Um, we were meeting. We had a meeting at the White House to prepare for the summit, and as the meeting broke up, the president came over to me and said, uh, so how does it feel to be a deliverable at, from a presidential summit? And what he meant was the summit, among the things they were going to agree to was that the ambassadors would return to uh, the respective capitals. So the president said to me, how does it feel to be a deliverable at, at, a, uh, at a presidential summit? And I, I just joked, and he said, he looked at me and said, so you really want to go back to Moscow? And I said, oh, yes, sir. And he said, really? You really want it? Like, are you out of, are you, is there something, are you off your locker? <laughs> President Trump, several years before when I first went to Moscow, basically said the same thing to me. He asked me, you really want to do this? And he thought back, back then, he thought that um, I was at the time the deputy Secretary of State, and he thought that the then Secretary of State wanted to move me out, Secretary Pompeo. Not true. I asked, I wanted to do this. But President Trump couldn't understand why anybody would leave a cushy office on Mahogany Row at the State Department and go to cold and hostile Moscow as ambassador. And he just looked at me like, are you off your rocker? So that was two presidents (laughs) who thought I was crazy to go to Moscow, but I wasn't. It was a fantastic fantastic experience. You know, you mentioned COVID, and we ought to talk about that a little bit, because yeah. there, you have mentioned this uh, previously that, and I know this from my own experience, the lockdown in Moscow, yeah. the mishandling, the number of people who died, the, the lying by the government, then, you know, the truth by bloggers, and also toward the end, like as the beginning, as the war begins, you have President Putin, these images at a gigantic yeah. table, uh, you know, 40 feet away from his interlocutor. Yeah. Um, so can you tell a little bit how sure. you were affected by that? Oh, it was, it was, it was, in some ways, almost even more so than the war had a bigger impact on my functioning and my, uh, my work as ambassador. Um, so I arrived, I was confirmed as ambassador in mid-December of 2019. I got to Moscow beginning of January. Within three months, the pandemic had swept the world. Moscow, Russia, was late in having a dramatic effect. Remember, um, 
Northern Italy was being dramatically impacted, and the Russians sent ventilators, medical equipment mm. with Russia, from Russia with love. Um, and I remember sitting in my office at, at the embassy and following um, what the Russian government was doing and saying about the pandemic and crazy statements like, well, you know, those, those Mediterranean people, you know, the Italians, the Spaniards, the Americans, you know, the, the weakling Americans, we Russians are of a hardier stock and of course we'll never succumb to well, <clears throat> the pandemic hit Moscow and hit, hit the rest of the country very hard. Um, what's, what people may not realize is that at the end of March, uh, the Russian government imposed, or at least the, the cities of Moscow and St. Petersburg, imposed very significant lockdowns. Um, and of course it was uh, the, Russian, the Russians, in some ways, I, I love the Russian people. I love the country, but sometimes I just I shake my head. Uh, President Putin announced the lockdown, but he couldn't say it was a lockdown. What he said was that uh, this was at the very start. It was the end of. I'd have to get a calendar to look. It was a Friday, or maybe it was a Thursday, the end of March. The weather's turning nice, and he said, "You know what?" We're gonna declare a holiday from work. It's a beautiful day in Moscow on Friday, and people are out hugging, you know. They, oops. So they announced the lockdown by saying it's gonna be a work holiday. And that wasn't really effective public health. So they imposed a pretty significant uh, lockdown, and it was enforced. Um, I remember driving around the streets. The streets were empty. The buses continued to run, and they were all empty. I remember driving at night home from the embassy to Spasso House, passing a bus. Not a person on it except the driver. All in, but the buses kept running. No one on the streets. Um, vigorously enforced. Uh, there was controversy. Russians love dogs. Uh, there was a man. There was a limit on how far a person could walk to get exercise from where they lived. And a man took his dog out for a walk farther than he was supposed to be from his home. And he got arrested, and the police arrested him, tied the dog to a street light, left the dog, and arrested the man. Public outrage that they had abandoned a dog. But just an example, they really did enforce this. The problem that they had was that their grand celebration of the 75th anniversary of the, uh, the triumph and the great patriotic war was to happen on March 9th, May, May 9th, excuse me. Uh, we celebrated on May 8th, they celebrated on May 9th. Uh, they don't acknowledge that there was really a war in the Pacific, but that's a whole other story. May 9th is the end of the Second World War, the great patriotic war from, from their perspective. And Putin was planning a big, big parade and party, and he wanted President Trump to come Trump hadn't said he would, but he wanted Trump to come. But they couldn't have it. They, 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 the, the, it was just, <clears throat> the COVID situation was just too dangerous. So before May 9th, they declared they, were, they couldn't have the parade on May 9th, so we're gonna have the parade on June 24th. Come hell or high water, we're gonna have a parade on June 24th. Um, Every, I, I remember people thinking at the time, this was in, in April, you know, I wonder how long this pandemic will last. Do you think, are we gonna be on a lockdown through Memorial Day, you know, <laughs> end of May? We, we didn't say which year, it, it turned out being years, years in the future, but anyway, you'll be shocked to learn that on June 10th, exactly two weeks before the uh, date for the Victory Day Parade, Mayor Sobianin, declared, there's been a decrease in COVID cases in Moscow. It's safe to have the parade. Some of the COVID restrictions were lifted, uh, and they did have the parade. No, virtually very few uh, foreign leaders. I went on behalf of the United States. I sat with the, the British ambassador. She and I sat together. Um, it, you know, it didn't turn out to be a super spreader. It was outdoors on, on Red Square, as, as you know. 
Uh, and uh, but it's just an example of how uh, the Russian government wasn't treating the the pandemic with the seriousness it uh, it required. There were many more people who died in Russia from uh, from COVID, and to this day, the Russian and we've seen this in China as well. Then the Russian government uh, admitted they uh, declared Sputnik a uh, a fully tested and efficacious vaccine in July, August of 20, long before there could have been any conceivable proper testing of the vaccine, and that did two things. Sputnik wasn't as effective as Western vaccines, A, and B, Everybody knew that they were lying, and so it, it made the public distrustful of getting vaccinated. So vaccination rates in Russia are uh, have been have been low. Uh, there was a slew doctors who were complaining or not necessarily going along with the government's line on the pandemic. I can't. I lost count at five of the number of doctors who accidentally fell out of hospital windows. Yeah. Uh, so the pandemic, but so it was, it was interesting to observe how the Russian government handled the pandemic. The effect on me, a couple of things. First, I couldn't meet in person with any Russians. They wouldn't meet with me. I didn't want to meet with them. Um, senior Russian government officials are not just ministry ministers, but deputy ministers, any one of them who got sick or tested positive was hospitalized, mm. many of them multiple times. So I know, I think there are 10, 12 deputy foreign ministers of, unlike the United States, I used to joke with my friend Sergei Ryabkov, who's the deputy foreign minister, we talk about, you know, imbalance in our nuclear weapons. They said they have a great advantage on us. They have 12 deputy foreign ministers and we have one deputy secretary. But at one point, I think I had a, I, I kept track, 10 or 11 of the 12 were hospitalized, some multiple time for COVID. Hmm. Lavrov was hospitalized 12, twice for COVID. Wow. Putin. But Putin uh, didn't want to get sick. Uh, and Putin, Putin isolated himself, and there were stories about people who came to visit him had to isolate for weeks in advance, and when they approached wherever he was, there was this tent with mist that had, you know, these disinfectants that people had to walk through. There were the famous uh, images of him sitting at a 40-foot table at one end with his interlocutor, whether it's President Macron or... Uh, Shoigu, the defense minister, and Karasimov at the other end, he wasn't going to get sick, or he was going to do everything he can to avoid getting sick. Uh, but uh, Russia really struggled with, uh, with the pandemic, and it meant we were concerned about the oper effect on our embassy. Uh, we tried to, as best we could, the way the NBA and the NHL did to create our own little bubble, uh, but we had to allow Russians to come in from the outside um, nannies, you name it, people who work at the embassy. So we were fortunate. Uh, we didn't, we had one locally employed national at our consulate in Vladivostok who passed away, uh, regrettably, in December of 20. He had a comorbidity, he was a cancer survivor, uh, had been very sick with cancer, recovered, come back to work, was beloved at the consulate, but he passed away. We had one officer at the embassy in Moscow who had to be medevaced. Um, it was just after Thanksgiving, no, late November of 20. He and his wife and his teenage son had gone out in the city, come back, they all tested positive for COVID. His wife and his son recovered pretty quickly, he had trouble getting over it, and over a course of days, his fever continued to spike. We had a terrific medical staff at the embassy, and they spotted it, and they said, he's got to be medevac. And he came here to Washington, where we're sitting, uh, and not far away from here at the GW Hospital. He spent 40, over 40 days in the intensive care unit hmm. uh, with recovering from COVID. If we hadn't medevac him, he might have been a, uh, a casualty of ours, but fortunately, we didn't have any Americans who passed away. Yeah. Well, I, I guess one question we have to get into is nuclear arms control. Yes. 
Okay, so we, we have the <coughs> strange thing you mentioned, extension mm -hmm. of start, good news. But then you also have um, recent comments by President Putin yep. and other officials, uh, pre, uh, former President Medvedev yes. specifically, uh, to almost saying, yep. w watch out, we may use nuclear weapons. Yeah. So what would you say, in brief, is the Russian approach to this? Do they take it seriously? Do they want to continue arms control negotiations with the United States? They do. But what is their one, what's the one last stronghold that they have? Their own military has been revealed to be a paper tiger. Uh, their credibility is, you know, is shot. What have they got that make, continues to make them relevant? Well, there's energy. Energy is being hit in their nuclear weapons. They're, they, have, they leverage those nuclear weapons. It's one thing that they can leverage that scares everybody. Do I think they want to start a nuclear war? Obvious. I sincerely believe they do not. But they will go as close to the edge to leverage that strength that they have uh, for their own benefit and against us. Mm -hmm. You know, Russia's foreign policy, if you look at it right now, and a lot of this has kind of come under the microscope with the Ukraine war. But Russia's um, uh, desire to have relations beyond the West, mm -hmm. to deal with other developing countries, um, you know, India, obviously China, et cetera. What would you say um, is this, d d and Dmitry Trinian talks about this, that this is very important for Russia, a strategic necessity. Well, what's the scorecard here? Are they actually succeeding in having that beyond the West diversification? You know, I don't know that it's increasing diversification in many ways. We were just talking about nuclear weapons. The Russian Federation is the beneficiary of the fact that the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. The Russian Federation is not the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union encompassed uh, a lot of other uh, Soviet republics, including Ukraine and Belarus. But R Putin and many Russians treat themselves as the successor, this is the theme of the Ukrainians talking about whether Russia should be on the uh, Security Council. Russia is the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union is Russia. That's not so. My point though, Jill, is the Soviet Union had defense relationships in particular in India, in Egypt, that those countries have continued to rely on. They use Soviet, some of them, Soviet era equipment that they need the Russians for spare parts, service, et cetera. You talk to the Indians, and I've had this conversation with senior Indian officials. They understand what Russia's about, but they can't just cut off relations with Russia. If I mean, they've got the commercial relations, energy, and so forth, but even if we were able to get over all that, the relation of their military to the Russian military, a legacy of the Soviet era, that still binds them. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, I think the big question, of course, that we have g going forward is how does the United States build a relationship, rebuild, <coughs> construct, under the circumstances that we have right now? Right. And it's a very broad question, but yeah. I think there, there must be some guideposts that you yourself have established for what can we learn from this? Is there a way of constructing a relationship right now? Uh, what do we do under these circumstances? Well, I certainly went to Russia. I mean, relations were bad when I arrived in late 2019, early 20, and it was my firm view that uh, we needed to, as, as eminent uh, a, a person as Henry Kissinger said, we've got to continue to live with and, and uh, engage with, uh, with Russia, permanent member of the Security Council, nuclear weapons. The size of their economy is still significant, 145 million people. Uh, my problem, though, is after February 24th, what they've done, what Putin has done, I believe is uh, it's, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to overcome that. How can anybody trust the Russian government again? We talked about the lies that they told. Who could trust them? 
Now, I may get in trouble for going down this road, but I can't help thinking about it because I make comparisons with, and I've done in the past, including with my colleagues in government, to September 1st, 1939. You look at what the Germans did. The, rush, the German rationale for invading Poland on September 1st, 1939, Hitler said this, he crossed the border shortly after the invasion began, and he, he thanked his, his Wehrmacht and his soldiers uh, for rescuing Germans in Poland who were being subject to Polish barbarism. His word translated, right? This is a phony border in the East created out of, uh, out of the mess of Versailles, imposed on Germany, separating German people who are now being abused by Poles. I, like Frederick the Great, I'm going to overcome this. I'm going to rejoin our Volk. Let's assume that his army stalled in Poland the way the Russian army stalled in Ukraine. Now, this is where it gets tough because we know what's coming with Hitler. I'm not saying that Putin is going to engage in a Holocaust and have concentration camps of the scale the Nazis did. They do have uh, filtration camps, however. But what would you say, what would you have said, would you say the same thing if the Wehrmacht was stalled in November, December 39, January, February, March of 40? What's the off-ramp for Hitler? Look what we did to the Germans after World War I. We've got to get along with Germany. Well, how are we going to make this better? We've got to help Hitler find a way to save face. This is all in quotes. <laughs> These are my quotes, right? Yes. Imagine his Wehrmacht was as discombobulated as the Russian military and failed when it invaded Poland or stalled. But, but Hitler still had his ambitions. What would we say? Mm. We know what we said in 37, 38, and early 39. Oh, we're doing that now if we're talking about off-ramps. Now, to answer your question, Russia is still a member of the Security Council. It has a large, larger than the United States, we believe, because they, we have to, I have to say we believe, because the Russians won't disclose the size of their nuclear arsenal, non-strategic nuclear arsenal. It doesn't relieve us of the obligation for engaging with them, but this is going to be a long, arduous, difficult problem. And there's a moral dimension to it, a legal dimension, which Zelensky brings up all the time, war crimes. Yeah. War crimes. If you think about the Germans who hanged the, the lead defendants at Nuremberg, there were 11, I believe. Goering, Goering killed himself before he was hanged. But of those defendants, the first, the first German hanged at Nuremberg was von Ribbentrop, the foreign minister. What was his principal role? So they were all convicted of crimes against peace, waging an aggressive war against Poland, uh, war crimes, the massacre of Americans at Malmedy and other war crimes, crimes against humanity, the Holocaust, and conspiracy to commit the first three crimes. We don't associate von Ribbentrop uh, with the Holocaust. He wasn't in the SS, he was a diplomat but he was directly involved in that aggressive war, and he hanged for it. Mm. The, ger the leadership of the German military, not the SS, but Field Marshal Keitel, who was in effect the defense minister, uh, General Jodl, the chief of staff, they hanged for waging an aggressive war. Now, Goering complained and said it was victor's justice. Maybe it was. Mm. But these war crimes that we've seen in Ukraine need to be investigated, and I believe, as Zelensky himself says, there needs to be justice, and there can't be peace. The Ukrainians won't allow there to be peace until there's justice. Hmm. And yet, to play the devil's advocate, yes. or maybe not that far, but there are who's, people who say, okay, we do have the war, mm -hmm. and we have this terrible relationship right now. However, we have other issues like climate change, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, epidemics, pandemics, mm -hmm. things that ultimately 
the world has to face. Is right. there any way that the United States and Russia can cooperate on some of these other issues? I view this, I've always said, um, and, and again, I, I volunteered to go to Moscow to be ambassador in large part because um, I am at heart a Russophile. Uh, love the Russian people and just uh, in, in, enraptured by Russian history, culture, etc., uh, and the tragedies of uh, of Russian history. Here's the modern tragedy: Russia could make an enormous contribution to the world during the pandemic. Russian scientists, instead of being used by their government to promote an a, uh, an ineffective Sputnik could have helped address the pandemic. Mm. I, got, I was invited to meet with the, the, uh, the health minister, Marasco, in end of July. It was my first, min my, he asked for it, my first meeting with a Rush, senior Russian government official after the, the major pandemic restrictions were lifted. This is late July of 2020. And the purpose of the meeting was he wanted to see if we, through me, that we could arrange um, interaction between him, his ministry, and CDC, NIH, researchers in the United States. Of course, absolutely. Within days, I won't say it was the next day, uh, there were reports that were later reported in the media of fairly wide scale Russian spying and intrusion, cyber intrusions on medical researchers in the United States, not just, and not just at Pfizer, but in the US government. And you know, my I said, look, you may not be responsible, but how how could can I have any credibility going to my government anyway? But that's a, the, tragic. I'm sure Marasco had no idea. Nobody said to him, hey, he's a medical doctor from Vlad uh, from uh, Yekaterinburg. Hey, doc, should we spy on the Americans? He had no idea. I'm sure, but his government did. And there were just so many other whether it's climate change. We, could, we should be negotiating now on nuclear weapons and a successor for the New Star Treaty. We have, um, if you're focused on arms control, we have wasted, uh, it's now 2023, two years since that treaty. That treaty was extended for five. Two of those years are now gone. There are three more years left. At the end of those three years, the treaty lapses. There's no legal way to extend the treaty beyond that without the US Senate having to ratify it. So two years have gone by, and we've, we've sought to have interaction just on implementing the New Star Treaty with the Russians under something called a bilateral consultative commission. The Russians say, we're not complying with the New Star Treaty, the conversion of some of our B-52 bombers, some of the, uh, the silos and our missile subs. Um, and we haven't had meetings of this uh, commission because of the pandemic. We should be having inspections, we're not. And we were supposed to resume inspections because the pandemic restrictions are no longer a reason not to, and the Russians won't allow it. So yeah, there are huge areas where we should be engaging with the Russians, and it's tragic that we aren't, we can't, and when we do, everything is turned to the advantage of the Russian state. I like to say, I hate to sound, it, it, my focus is on the Russian government, not Russia and the Russian people, but there's nothing sacred in Russia. And by that I mean even the, even the Orthodox Church is used by the security services. There's some question of whether the patriarch uses Putin, Putin uses the patriarch, but we look at what's happening in Ukraine. There's nothing that the state, that the Siloviki, the state, won't turn to their advantage, nothing sacred. It'd be the equivalent of the FBI sending special agents to seminaries, which is you know, what we believe, you know, the FSB has penetrated the church. So it's an enormous, enormous challenge, Jill, and it was why I wanted to go to Russia to try to, to make a difference, and it was extremely frustrating. I was frustrated by the pandemic, and then you mentioned before our diplomacy failed. I don't know what we could have, more we could have done to try to stop the war on the 24th. Um, I personally thought, as confident as I was that the Russians were going to invade, I didn't know what date, but I knew they were going to. Uh, 
um, I thought they were going to accomplish their objectives. I thought it was going to be like um, 1968, different. It's the Warsaw Pact. Roughly the same number of troops, though, 200,000 Warsaw Pact troops roll into Prague, put Dubček on a plane, take him to Moscow. Mm. I thought that's the, if I'm, if I'm Zelensky, that's the best that could happen to me. Otherwise, they're going to have my head on a platter. And look, look how it turned out. Uh, I, was, I was wrong about that. Yeah. But it, it is this recurring theme in relations. Mm-hmm. And you served a president who, depending upon the article that you're reading at the time, at least maybe wanted to pull out of NATO or at least had a um, jaundiced view, let's put it, of, of the alliance. Uh, then you have the Russians who alternately depict NATO as a gigantic existential threat mm-hmm. and then also a paper tiger, right. uh, which is controlled by the United States. Right. It tells its vassals what to right. do. So um, I, I think the most interesting thing would actually be what do the Russians really think about NATO behind the scenes, not just publicly? Do they fear it, respect it? Or do they really believe what they say, which is, we are ready to take on the world? So they view NATO as a threat. There's no doubt about that. Um, I don't know that respect is a word that's in their uh, vocabulary, but threats, they know. And they think NATO is a threat. President Trump would say he strengthened NATO. Far from being opposed to NATO, he strengthened NATO. And I heard him, I heard him make this argument many times. He'd say, but for my badgering, no other country in NATO would raise their defense budgets and strengthen NATO. It was all, being, it was all US money. I want the Germans, the French, et cetera. The so-called 2% Wales pledge or the meeting of of uh, the NATO leaders in Wales some years ago, where all the NATO members agreed to spend 2% of their GDP on uh, defense spending. Um, So in defense of Trump, I don't say that very often, but in defense of Trump, he certainly made very critical comments of NATO, but they were critical because he thought, and he thought this about a lot about the Europeans, that they were taking advantage of the United States. That's his argument. The Russians certainly view NATO as a threat, but here's what concerns me. Everyone focuses and everyone talks about NATO expansion east. Mm. And this is some aggressive plan by NATO to expand to the east, to absorb the former Soviet uh, satellites in uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia now, Czech Republic, Slovakia, et cetera. No one focused on the Baltics. No one focuses on the fact that it was those countries, their populations, that wanted to join NATO. It wasn't NATO, my spin on this is, it wasn't NATO uh, advancing east. It was those governments and peoples looking west because of the threat they knew well from Soviet days and that they believed continued in the form of the Russian Federation, even before Putin, they were fearful. And what are we to say to those people? Ah, you're on your own. So, look, we can debate NATO expansion, NATO membership, current issues, whether it's Ukraine, Georgia, the commitments that have been made. But if you're talking about NATO, you know, NATO's relentless march east, you're losing sight of the fact that it was the the peoples of Eastern Europe who wanted to become members of NATO, which is why NATO was drawn east. Uh, And you have to factor, at least factor that in to, you know, to, to the calculation. So um, NATO now, uh, Vladimir Putin has done more to strengthen NATO than any Western leader in the last 30 years by what he's done. But you know, it's a, a, another example of, uh, you know, the backfire of his special military operation, whether it was 
entrenching opposition to Russia in Ukraine, Sweden uh, and Finland joining NATO. Uh, it's uh, catastrophic for Russia, and we told them it would be. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the last official things that you did in Moscow was to attend the funeral, the memorial, for a president, former President Gorbachev. And there was a lot of remembering, you know, the Soviet Union, yeah. the Gorbachev days, and then modern Russia with Yeltsin and then Putin. Um, as you, I saw that picture of you, you know, yeah. standing in line. You looked as if you were thinking about things. Yeah. Can you let us in on some of your thinking about sure. that? Sure. Uh, I mean, it was it was very thought provoking for for me, both as an American diplomat, and for me personally. Um, my first trip to the Soviet Union, my first trip outside of North America, was to the Soviet Union in 1989. Uh, I dragged my wife. Uh, we spent a month and uh, we went to Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, as we called it, and Yalta. I didn't, uh, I, I didn't, it didn't really register with me that I was visiting two cities in Russia and two cities in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. That became a lot more significant to me later. Uh, but by that, by that point, by 1989, uh, Gorbachev was a global rock star with glasnost, perestroika, um, in the West. Uh, he was uh, not making fans with people like Lieutenant Colonel Putin in the KGB's office in Dresden. Um, and now those around Putin think that Gorbachev was a great failure, that he let the Soviet Union uh, uh, dissolve, and it didn't need to happen, this great cat catastrophe. Uh, so, uh, and the Russian leadership reflected that disdain for Gorbachev at his funeral. P uh, Putin didn't attend. My recollection was no senior, current senior Russian government official attended. The prime minister didn't attend. The former minister and uh, former prime minister, former president Medvedev certainly didn't attend. I did. I was there with uh, several other uh, diplomats, the UK ambassador, French ambassador, German ambassador. Um, I met his extended family. I stayed there for much of the morning, standing there with the mourners as a stream of Muscovites walked through to pay their respects. I don't know if you've ever seen the fairly recent movie, The Death of, I think it's The Death, Death of, Stalin. of Stalin. It was in the exact same Hall of Unions as Stalin's funeral. The casket was laid out in exactly the same way. The people marching in, and by the way, having now been in that venue, the people who did the movie set, it, it was looked exactly, I remember thinking, geez, this really looks like the movie. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they hadn't planned for as many people to come through the, the, uh, the line to uh, pay their respects. And it, it stretched for blocks and blocks way across Moscow. They had only planned, I think the funeral, the, the, the viewing was, the doors opened at say 8 a.m. and it was supposed to be done by noon and then there would be an internment ceremony at a, uh, at a, cer at a cemetery nearby, not in the Kremlin necropolis behind Lenin's tomb where the great Soviet leaders are, are buried. Um, and it got to be one o'clock, two o'clock, and the line, and finally they just shut the doors and there were, there were huge numbers of people who never got in and to see him. I thought that was telling. Um, and then he was buried, he's buried in this, this cemetery in, in Moscow, just a stone's throw from, it, within the cemetery from Khrushchev's tomb. And it occurred to me, you know, this is the cemetery where they send the disfavored former general secretaries who are not great heroes of the Soviet Union uh, and uh, there was uh, a, a, a you know sort of a corporal's guard of a military detachment. Uh, it really was not befitting uh, the the funeral for uh, a person who, as the leader of the Soviet Union, very briefly president, 
uh, of, uh, of the Soviet Union, um, I thought that you know history would have history would look back and think that he wasn't treated properly. But uh, he, unlike Khrushchev, had really done uh, remarkable things. So, uh, but the very fact that I'm able to say that is why he is reviled among mm. Putin and and his cronies. But on a on a personal level, Jill, what was um, what was most moving for me was that I had come, I'd gone to the Soviet Union, had been in, we were, my wife and I were in Moscow for uh, almost 10 days. It was August of 1989. Um, the weather was beautiful. The sun is shining, as you know, for almost the entire, uh, the entire day. Uh, and my memory of Moscow was, despite that, it was gray and grim. Right, compared to modern modern Moscow, uh, and now it's this a lot of oil wealth and we, uh, oil and gas money has gone in to build these skyscrapers and make it a city of light even in the dead of the dead of winter. But um, it's uh, it's not a city that would honor its former president the way he should have been. Yeah. So here we are with this very bad relationship right. with Russia. What do you say to young people, students who may want to go into this field, they may want to have your job, become it, diplomats, right. or maybe work in another area of international relations that has to do with Russia, the former Soviet Union. What do you say to them? Is, it, is, it, is there a, a future in the relationship for them? Absolutely. My gosh, now is the time to invest in that. I wish I spoke Russian. I took Russian language lessons while I was ambassador, and my my uh, my lessons went aploha badly. Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, if there's one thing that history teaches us, it's how things change in in the U.S. Russia U.S. Soviet relationship. I'm focused on this month, this year, next year. But there's going to be a relationship between whoever's running this country and whoever is running that country going into the future. The size of that Eurasian landmass, uh, the history there, which now includes this war in Ukraine, we need more diplomats and diplomacy, not fewer. Hmm. Hmm. Absolutely. And if I had been, if I had succumbed to... And, and Reagan wasn't saying this. When Reagan was talking about in his first term, uh, you know, the evil empire and it's on the ash heap of history, what if I had back then, to, well, why would I invest in becoming an expert on the Soviet Union or Russia? Look what I would have missed out on over the next 35 or more years. So absolutely. I'm pessimistic, extremely so, about what's going to happen in this war this year and in the Biden administration, the next two years of the Biden administration. Am I pessimistic? Well, let me put it this way. I think if I were investing in a career, I'd be bullish about how it's going to pay off for me in the long term. Studying Russia, studying Russian uh, will pay off. Mm. Well, Ambassador John Sullivan, thank you very much. Thank it you, Jill. It was really wonderful to talk to you. My pleasure. You.